I think the fundamental game though is the game of money. As long as we have a game of money and the rules of the game of the of money are all about extracting from nature and sending the money back to the people at the top, then we are always going to be in a climate heating system. Welcome to Facing Future. Today's guests are Celie Shrau and Larry Kopold. Celie Shrau is the founder of and executive director of climatehealers.org. With a PhD in engineering, he has over 13 patents in the US and Canada. He was a major contributor in the early development of the internet. In 2006, he turned his attention to the plight of animals in our food system. Salish is the executive producer of such documentaries as Cowspiracy, What the Health, and Milked. He's also featured in the film Countdown to Year Zero. This year, the Guardian newspaper recognized him as a climate hero, a foremost voice on the green transition and on the true scale of societal change required to save the planet. Larry Kopold is a lifelong environmentalist and founder and president of the Carbon Underground. He's also served on the boards of Greenpeace, Oceana, the National Marine Sanctuaries, and others. His work for the UN Communications Office, Earth Communications Office, was seen in over 100 countries by over a billion people. He's been nominated for both Emmy and Grammy Awards. Good to see you both. Good to be here. So forests, soils, and animals are critical to life on Earth. Yet over 25 million acres of forest are cut down each year, primarily to graze cattle and sheep. Three quarters of all farmland is devoted to animal agriculture. This destruction of habitat has eliminated at least 70% of all the wildlife on the planet since 1970. The numbers are staggering. Globally, 80 billion animals are killed for only 12% of our diets. To keep the meat and dairy industries afloat, this slaughter is subsidized. At the same time, we've lost most of the topsoil, which is a critical carbon sink. Regenerative farming offers a better way to grow food, but it includes grazing animals. Since a cow produces 25 tons of manure and 220 tons of methane each year, is this really an essential practice? Uh, to me, it is the most destructive thing we're doing on the planet uh, as far as uh, uh, our sustainability is concerned. And it is something that we can easily change. And because it is also based on falsehoods that we have bought into. Like you really need to eat meat in order to get protein, which is absolutely untrue because there is plenty of protein in all plant foods. In fact, all plant foods have all 20 amino acids. And uh, so you get plenty of protein if you eat any plant food, okay? So we know that, and yet we have been propagating this myth that you have to eat meat to get protein. And you have to drink milk to get calcium, which again is untrue. You can get plenty of calcium in other foods. So if a systems engineer was looking at how are we solving climate change, Right now, it looks like we are completely incompetent, you know, the way we are addressing climate change. Because if you, you have to first model, how are you going to solve the problem? And when you model it, you right away see that addressing animal agriculture should be our number one concern. And this is what the climate bathtub model was all about, you know. It showed, okay, taking your own data, taking the UN's data as it is, I put it together in a model and that showed that you have to address animal agriculture first. You know, if you look at how we are using land on the planet, humans have appropriated 91% of the ice-free land area of the planet for our uses. Only 9% is left for wild animals. This is why wild animals are dying so fast. And there we are going and grabbing another, you know, 25 to 30 million acres every year saying we need more, okay? And so this is unconscionable that we are continuing to do this. And, uh, and if you look at how we are using that land, the, the activity of animal agriculture is the only activity in which we don't replace trees with trees. 
we cut down the trees and turn that into grass because we are trying to grow grass to feed our animals. Whereas timber, you are using, you know, you're basically replacing those native trees with monocultures of trees. But at least there are some trees that come back up. Okay? Or for paper, we do the same thing, right? And then when we cut the trees for timber or paper, we replace them with more trees. Whereas when we deforest for animal agriculture, we basically bring grass back and whatever the animals don't eat, we cut and burn again every year in pasture maintenance fires. And that's what's been going on right now. And if we do regenerative animal agriculture or the idea of regenerative animal agriculture is like saying, you know, okay, we cut the forest in order to grow grass. And now we're gonna let some of that forest come back, but then we will have to manage it because we don't want the wild animals back. If the wild animals come back, then the cow, they're gonna eat the cows. So, you know, this is, this is a problem. And so why are we doing it? You know, is it healthy for us to eat it? It's not. We have, we have been pouring 250 billion tons of toxic chemicals into the environment every year. And those toxic chemicals, they concentrate in animal foods because they're all lipophilic. So we are deliberately eating food that makes us absolutely sick. Why are we doing that? Because we are funding the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a systemic issue. And so I say you have, we have created a system that is um, a climate heating, animal-based resource extraction economy. That's what it's based on. And we need to create a system that's based, that is for climate healing, it's plant-based, and it is an ecosystem restoration economy. So the purpose of humanity needs to change. So I disagree with that. No, I, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, uh, I couldn't agree more. And just to add to the absurdity of feeding animals is the, is the amazing thing that we are now scooping shrimp out of the oceans to feed livestock in Iowa. This is, I'm sure, exactly how nature intended for all of this to work. A um, couple of things. And, and uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about climate change and what really, why we have climate change and why words matter tremendously. So many, many years ago, we were promised by Big Ag a green revolution. That sounds fantastic. It sounds wonderful. There's only one problem. The Green Revolution turned the planet brown. We're, you know, according to the UN, we've killed or, or, or highly degraded 70% of the world's topsoil. And let me explain what soil's role is in nature, because I think it's critically, critically important. Soil is, is part and a critical part of photosynthesis of the process. And photosynthesis is what nature uses to keep the carbon levels and the cycle in balance, right? We all know it. We break the molecule and we have oxygen and, 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 and carbon goes down. It's used by the plants. It's turned into a sugar. They take some of it, but a, a huge amount of it goes down into the soil to feed the, the 7 billion living things in a teaspoon of healthy soil. When the soil is no longer healthy, those, those organisms don't exist. Nature says, well, if I bring all of this carbon down, I have no place to do it. Nobody wants it anymore. So I'm just going to leave it up in the atmosphere where it is. That's why we have climate change. And, and this is really important as well. We need to start looking at soil not only as a critical engine of drawing the trillion tons of CO2 we've emitted back down into the earth to, to let nature use it for us, let us use it as well. Uh, but we need to understand that soil is a living entity. So when you look at it as a carbon sink, there is a finiteness to that. So, so if you were to say to me, well, you know, how much carbon could I store in this acre over here or this hectare over there? I, I now have to answer, well, it depends. As you restore the health of that soil, the soil will grow. And, and as soil grows it, obviously, the amount, the potential of carbon that it can draw down and, and store becomes greater. So 
uh, it's really, really important, you know, and, and uh, Salish, you, you mentioned animal agriculture. You know, it, it is fascinating to me that, that it's estimated now that we now have more chickens in captivity than there are wild birds on the planet. We need to think about that for a second. We, we need to think about the image we have of cows. What's a, what's a beautiful image of a cow? Well, they're off in the pasture and it's green and it's lovely. Both chickens and cows are forest animals. And, and, and I, I question you to think about when's the last time you saw any picture showing forests and chickens living in the forest, but that's how it works. That's how they evolved. So the, the criticality of changing how we're thinking right now, you know, words really do matter. The Green Revolution is one example, but right now we're being told that the population of the planet is going to go from 8 billion to 10 billion, and therefore we need to double our food production. Now, I'm not sure where they get their math, but eight, two does not equal eight. I don't know how they get that, but all people hear is that we need to double our food production when we all know that if we just took the waste out of the food system, we could feed our planet and, you know, probably half of another one. And, and so the, the, shift of the system, and I think what, what Salish is talking about that's so critically important, and I love, you know, you talk about climate healing, right? Where the optimism comes from, for all of us, I think, who are working in this area, is exactly that second word. Nature heals. It's part of the system. It's built in. If you cut your finger, it will heal. And there has never been, never, as far as we can see, a large-scale, well-funded project to test how nature can heal that hasn't far exceeded any of the wildest expectations. Nature wants to do this. It's in her nature. And, and, and if we would allow that to happen, you know, when the, when the UN wrote that paper about 70% of the topsoil being dead or degraded, they titled it, Wake Up Before It's Too Late. And one of the things they said in that paper that they wrote in 2013 was that we had 60 harvests left, okay? That was 10 years ago. So if you wanna feed the planet, you're not gonna do it with the same practices that are destroying the soil, destroying the ability to feed the planet. And, and I, I couldn't agree, I'm not gonna, I don't want to get into the, the 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 discussion of whether somebody should or wants to eat meat or whatever. Um, you know, a lot of indigenous people have eaten meat for many, many, many centuries. But we cannot, we absolutely cannot continue to support that industry the way it is today. And, you know, uh, one of you mentioned the subsidies going to the meat industry. Subsidies is also, you know, every time you hear we can't afford to do blank, look at subsidies and how they're getting in the way. So a study just came out where the, the, the world gives the oil companies about $600 billion, billion a year in subsidies. And yet the study that just came out said that on average for the past 50 years, the oil industry has made a trillion dollars a year in profits. Yeah. Really where we should be putting our taxpayer dollar. They're really where we should be investing that money. If we took that 600 billion a year and put it in restoring this planet, it, it, you know, there we go. We, we, we will turn things around. And, you know, Bill Gates wrote a book on climate change read whatever you want into that. But, but, but one of the things that Bill Gates called for, he said, we need an army to fight climate change. And I couldn't agree more. That's what we need. We have an army of 2 billion people. They're, because 2 billion people are the stewards of the soil of the earth. They're the ones that grow most of our food. 
Two billion people are small <laughs> farmers around this planet. And if you empower them to grow food in a regenerative way, which costs them a whole lot less money, which grows healthier food, which, which improves the food security and the yield security, they're all going to do better but we have to figure out how to empower them. So we work with a lot of very large food companies and governments in working on that. But, but one of the most critical things that has to happen is they have to share in the revenue that comes from restoring this planet. So we all hear a lot about environmental service payments. And, and Salish, I know that you've talked a lot about that. The, the environmental service payments that go to farmers is very nascent. One, if you look at carbon credits, for example, less than 1% of all the carbon credits on earth today come from agriculture. And yet, that's the thing that's really going to save the planet. I would like to hear, Larry, because I know that Carbon Underground works with the regenerative farming movement. And sure. regenerative farming which is, you know, spreading around and, you know, it's doing good things, but it insists one of the requirements is that you have to have grazing animals as part of your equation. And I think that's very odd and unnecessary. And Silesh has said that he thinks it's unnecessary. What do you think? Well, I, I, a couple of things. Um, and I don't, know of a definition we wrote the first standardized definition that didn't have anything about grazing animals it does talk about the importance of ruminants on a land to keep land healthy and there's a difference i don't care if you eat them but 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 keeping soil healthy you have to have the things that nature needs to keep it healthy and so um uh, you know that's our philosophy if you want nature to regenerate you have to let it use the tools of a hoof compressing the soil or, or manure on the soil or bringing the flies in and, 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 and the types of things that nature has created within the system of, of keeping things healthy. We need to have the native, native animals in that region yeah. to bring back the native ecosystems in that region. So it all, it all begins you know, with, uh, with water management and making sure that the water, the water tables are back up you know, and they, the water is being retained in that region. And then the animals come. The animals come to drink the water. And then they drop their seeds and new trees are born. You know, This right. is how ecosystems have been restored in lots of places. And, but it doesn't require us to bring our own domestic animals and then you know, graze them and manage them and all that. It doesn't require us to do that. See, I look at climate healing as an engineering project. Okay? It is an engineering project because there is an objective just to heal the climate and to maintain it at, at an optimum level, okay? And when you have an objective like that, you are really in a team that's working towards that objective. And when you have a team like that, you have to make sure that every member of the team feels like they belong in the team, feels like that they are treated fairly, that they're taken care of, okay? And that begins by honoring those who are serving in that team. And... Like right now, we have a system where a woman who grows rice gets paid five cents a pound so that someone can sell that rice for $2 a pound in the city. Uh, the, it is, you have to look at it from a systems perspective and understand how do we leverage the transformation from the current climate heating system to a climate healing system. And that requires us to look at the foundations of the system, you know, what is it based on? What are the foundational axioms? You know, what are the stories we tell? How, why is that woman going along with this, this ab abject uh, you know, uh, poverty that she's subjected to, even though she's working extremely hard, right? So why is she going along with it? Because we have told her a story. This is how it is. This is how life is, right? And we who are sitting in the city, you know, we deserve all these comforts and you don't, you know? <laughs> and she's saying, okay, how do I get that comfort? And then she tries to move to the city. Okay. She wants to be part Meat of the- Meat is part of the grotesque inequality. Exactly. Uh, eating animals is rich people and that's, you know, where the wealth comes in. And instead, right. if people ate plants, everyone could eat well. You know, uh, it seems the, the numbers are so, it's, it's just math. You know? it's right, so simple. it's simple third grade math. Yeah, it's third grade arithmetic, really. 
you look at the land that's used and you look at how much CO2 has been taken away from that land just to graze animals. You know, I mean, we are using 37% of the land area of the planet, okay, to graze animals. And that's only storing 2% of the land carbon. And land has three times as much CO2 as the atmosphere. Can we not increase the CO2 on, on land by 10% and therefore restore the, uh, the climate on the planet? Because all we need to do is to reduce the atmospheric CO2 by 30%. Okay, so this is allowing nature to heal. And by bringing back the ecosystems that we cut on that land, we can literally reverse climate change. I, I, this is an interesting point that um, if if we have systems that allow the natural wildlife of an area to return mm -hmm. instead of bringing our cows and sheep and then raising the oh this is great you know we'll also have a byproduct of this wonderful farming because we can create food for wealthy people let's face it it's not going to go to the poor people of the world um, in, but we're also not creating the possibility of habitat for the animals, which is what we need to be doing as well. So it mm -hmm. has a double, you know, a purpose to to right. not having those animals. To what I how I see it and how Silesh yes. sees it. But I, I, I think that's a really good point, and and I want to pick up on what Silesh was just saying. The the this is systems based. Nature is the ultimate system. And if we leverage the systems that nature or God I, has created, there are methodologies built in there to keep it from throwing the planet off balance. We've had, we've had 15 times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere that we have today at, before we were here. And, and, and guess what? Nature pulled it back down. There was an explosion of abundance. Gosh, wouldn't that be nice to see that again? Well, you know, yes, we have. We all agree we have to change. We all agree that we're doing horrible things to the planet at this point. But um, I don't think we quite agree on on the necessity or lack of necessity for having any sort of animal in our diet. The fish are also the other problem. I mean, the ocean is heating tremendously. It's acidifying and we're overfishing it. And if we don't have those larger fish, we won't have the overturning in the ocean of cold water and hot water and you know the exchanges and the oceans will die. And if the oceans die, you know we die. So it, it's not just meat, it's also fish is, is, is a large part of the problem. Um, this kind of the what Silish was saying earlier, the idea that we need to eat animals in order to have protein has been drummed into our heads and people, well, what do you do for protein? <laughs> um, but there are you know, proteins in plants. Um, so the, the transition has to uh, accommodate the best diet for the most people. Right. And, and that means, I, to me, plant-based diet which by the way, was included at one point in the UNFCC, uh, the, the IPCC report. It was gonna say plant-based diet and you know there was a leaked <laughs> uh, draft and it was changed to healthy diet, which means really anything to anybody. Uh, so there's been a cowardice to uh, you know, really accomplish the task here to get mm -hmm. to that issue in the, in the uh, mechanisms of the climate change movement um, to even bring it on the agenda. Silesh uh, and I were in Glasgow. It was, where was it on the agenda? Where, where were people talking about it? They weren't. Even in the, in the cafeterias of the UN, it was, you had to struggle to get a vegan sandwich. There was one in the back in the freezer. You know, everything was, you know, all animal foods. So, you know, this, this has to be writ large in our consciousness right. rather than saying, oh, well, we can see, feed them seaweed, we can incorporate them into uh, regenerative farming methods. I mean, we need to say, no, you, need to, you don't need to eat animals, period. Right. You know, that, see, Dale, the reason you know, it's not coming out, it's not being, the, the best I can guess as to why it's not coming out is that the objective function of all these UN meetings, et cetera, is to preserve the system. You know, they are trying to figure out how to stay on top, <laughs> whatever they mean by top, right? And, and that's the game we have been playing for 10,000 years. And it's a climate heating game. There's nothing we can do. If we continue along with that game to preserve civilization as we know it, you are going mm -hmm. to create 
a climate heating system. That's what it is. So I'm saying, you know, you need to now organize around restoration, ecosystem restoration. You need to organize around social justice. Our role is to be the thermostat species of the planet. And that's the story we tell at Climate Healers. So now you have a purpose. And now you say, okay, how do I implement that purpose? Which means your education system has to change. It has to be focused on that overarching objective. And so uh, our cities have to change because our cities are now focused on extracting from the ecosystems of the planet. That's why we congregate in cities to figure out how best to go and grab stuff from others, you know, from, from the surrounding areas or from elsewhere. Uh, so now we need to create cities which are about restoring the ecosystems that they're in locally. Okay? So that means that people are coming together for that purpose. It's a different purpose. Right. And so I think, I think the fundamental game, though, is the game of money. As long as we have a game of money and the rules of the game of, the, of money are all about extracting from nature and sending the money back to the people at the top, then we are always going to be in a climate heating system. So we need to change the rules of the game and change the game of money. You're right. If we can destroy it, we can fix it, right? And, and by the way, that's the capital we, this is not, we don't leave this up to the guys in Silicon Valley or here, or, right. or we can't do that anymore, number one. Uh, number two, they, they don't usually go toward using nature as their business partner. And, and nature is the greatest <laughs> business partner we've ever been offered. Uh, but I think before any of this is going to happen, we have to demand honesty. And, and one of the most dangerous things, and we can come up with all the reasons why this might be happening, is the fact that the entire planet's uh, theory of change for climate change is to shift to renewable energy, stop burning fossil fuels. And, and the truth of the matter is, if we stop burning fossil fuels before we end this phone call, 100% stop, it wouldn't do anything for climate change because of the legacy carbon, the trillion tons of CO2 we've already put up there. And any discussion that does not include drawing that back down is a dishonest conversation. If, if, if what are we at, 420 parts per million? If a 420 pound man went to the doctor's office and the doctor did a physical and said, you know what? You've got heart disease and diabetes and this and all this kind of stuff. So you know what we have to do? We have to slow down the rate at which you're gaining weight. He would die. <laughs> and guess what? So will we, if we don't acknowledge both sides of climate change. And the great news is that we've made great progress on renewable energy, fantastic pro progress on it. We can not only learn from how to how to spread that throughout a system, but again, the when nature is your your business partner, nature funds many of the costs. Yeah, in fact, uh, Larry, you know, when you said if we were to turn off fossil fuels by the time we end this call today, not only will we do nothing about the CO two we have put into the atmosphere, we will also eliminate all of the uh, aerosols the sulfur dioxide, and that will heat up the climate. Correct. Even, even faster. And you say, right. what the heck are you doing? And who, who's talking about solutions like this? Right. Right? So it's like the opposite of what you should be doing. I mean, it's to me, it is just pathetic. The discussion in the mainstream is at a pathetic level of engineering competence. Okay? It's mm -hmm. filled with people who don't understand how to model, how to engineer, how to, how to solve problems. Engineering is about solving problems. And we have done this so many times in so many different projects, right? We successfully sent a man to the moon. That is a great engineering project, mm -hmm. right? And when you do engineering, you know there are processes you have to put in place. You have to understand how to do certain things. And we seem to have thrown everything that we know out the window and let a bunch of amateurs and politicians run engineering projects. That's what's going on. Why is there an IPCC? Why is it an intergovernmental panel on climate change? What the heck are the governments doing yeah. doctoring 
scientific reports. Right. What are they doing? Yeah. That's right. And I'm saying, okay, if you start being in alignment with nature, if you start working with nature, guess how fast you can heal? You know, if we take this animal out of the equation and we put back the, the natural animals that should live in those environments, we allow them to return or, or we even, you know, help it along. Um, we can have ecosystems rapidly recovering. And John Liu has, has shown this all over the world in his eco restoration camps, incredible stuff that, you know, we can, re we can restore hydrological cycles, even to the desert. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in summary, thank you both. Uh, it's been amazing to talk to you. And, and to um, to talk about this uh, really critical part of the climate equation where it's not fossil fuels and it's it, it has to be both things. And in fact, the nature restoration has to be primary and the money has to go there first. Restoration of the natural system, that's really the most important thing that we need to do right now. Yeah. So thank you both for being here on Facing Future. It's been a really interesting conversation. And um, you, I look forward to seeing you again. As you always, fascinating conversation with you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>